Hey, it's Well Red Beard. Uh, I appreciate you being here. I'm back full time on my channel. I would love for you to come over and subscribe. Just search Well Red Beard on YouTube. Um, I delve deep into horror. I've spent the last three years uh, reading a ton of independent small press horror. There's treasure to be found there, and I go out there and find it for you. I, I'm not afraid to tell you the books that aren't great while telling you the books that are great. I don't break hearts or hurt feelings, but if a book doesn't work for me, I will tell you that, and I'll tell you why. I'm on a new mission now to, to go back and dig into some great horror from the 80s and 90s. I'm working my way through Robert McCammon's books. I'm going to look at all of Peter Straub's work. I'm going to do uh, Brian Keene. I've got aspirations to go back and do J.F. Gonzalez. A lot of the greats. So you have a good idea of where to start. I have a video up for J.F. Gonzalez's Survivor, so you can see what all the fuss is about. I recently read Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian, so you can see what all the fuss is about. Uh, I just want you to come over and subscribe. I'm trying to grow the thing. I appreciate you taking a look at it. This is Well Read Beard. I hope you're enjoying all your books as much as I am. If not, you're reading the wrong damn books. I do have one question. Because the title, the title of my book, I don't want to get you guys flagged for anything by saying cocksucker. Oh, that's all right. Okay, I just want to ask because some podcast I've been on, they're like, just call it whatever you want. Don't call it cocksucker. No, uh, gobbler. No. <laughs> <There you> go. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Dead Headspace. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough. Joined always by my co-host, Brent LaFaro. Say hi, Brennan. Hello, everybody. Today, we are talking with two authors, Wiley Young. Say hello, Wiley. Hello, everybody. And Lucas Milliron. Say hello, Lucas. How's it going? pretty great so uh you guys um your content of your stories are they're pretty different i would say uh i don't know who wants to answer this first so i'll I'll just pick lucas what got you into horror well i would say it was uh my parents definitely got me into it i've been watching horror since i was about five years old uh i grew up on a lot of the black and white stuff Favorite movie growing up, hands down, is Creature from the Black Lagoon. Nice. Um, the fact that it took place in Florida, the fact that there was a gill man, you know, girls in bikinis, even at five, I'm like, huh, I'm confused, <laughs> but I like it. Um, but that was basically it. And then from there, uh, reading fiction was Clive Barker. Um, I started really young with Thief of Always. While everybody else was reading Goosebumps, I was reading Damnation. Or a damnation game. So, yeah, I started young. You started reading that at five? Well, I started reading Damnation Game at around um, 12. That's still young. Wow. A little bit. A little bit. I was a kid. I was definitely a little too young. My parents were just happy I was reading. I mean, growing up dyslexic, if, if I could get through a book, it was a good thing. And with Clyde Barker, it was the imagery that really made me slow down and pay attention to what i was reading that's interesting let's return to that uh wiley what got you into horror similar story uh, mostly it was my parents uh, not paying attention <laughs> they uh my dad let me watch the 1934 wolfman so the original black and white one which has remained my favorite from the that's universe. mine too yeah it's awesome yeah <laughs> The universe, which remain my favorite from the Universal movies, followed by Creature from the Black Lagoon. And I think I was a werewolf for Halloween every single year until I could stop trick or treating. And then I was still a werewolf when uh, like kids would walk up in the yard and I like jump out of bushes and scare them. They drop their candy and I take it. So, <laughs> so there was that. Um, and I started, um, unlike Lucas, I was reading Goosebumps and stuff at the appropriate age. But I was also reading the classics, uh, Dracula, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I read those at a very young age. Must have read Dracula three, four times. And from there, it, when I got when I was a teenager, it became Fear Street. And then watching, you know, like The Ring was really popular back in the day. And I was I had a phobia of it for a very long time. And so then uh, I was think I was a sophomore when I read my first uh like horror novel that really resonated with me i'd already read stephen king and lovecraft and a lot of dane coons at that point 
Uh, but then I read Brian Keene's The Rising, and it uh, went from there. Brendan, I feel like this is something that you should reply to. I just feel like you got a really interesting question. You do, huh? All right. Um, no, I, I love the idea, um, and both of you kind of presented it, but uh, more so, Lucas, of we've heard from so many authors who um, kind of are in that same boat where they read inappropriate books at an inappropriate age because it's almost like there's less checking in um, if you're reading something than if you're watching something. Um, and I am so interested in the damnation game at 12 because that <laughs> is, you know, like besides just the content, like that is just such an adult book in terms of prose and everything. And it has the imagery. You're absolutely right. Um, but truth be told, I'm very interested to hear um, about your reading experiences with dys dyslexia. My son's dyslexic. Um, and that's something that we've worked very hard uh, to help him read. And, you know, I, w I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experiences with that. Sure. Um, for me, I was undiagnosed throughout most of my life. It actually wasn't until college that I actually had a teacher who said, hey, you might actually dis be dyslexic. It was actually when I was in optician school because one of the teachers was a English teacher as a second language. Um, Miss, uh, Miss McKee was my professor there. Um, because I'm Hispanic, when I was young, I spoke a lot of Spanish and not a whole, not as, I mean, English is my first language, but I also spoke way more Spanish than I do now. So they always assumed that my Spanish was why I was having a hard time reading. Well, mm -hmm. The problem is, is I was also not doing very well in math. And some people will present, you know, dyslexia when they write numbers specifically backwards. Like even to this day, if I write a six, I have to make sure that I'm not writing it the wrong direction, um, which is interesting when I work in an industry that's 90% numbers. But no, it was just learning how to slow down. It was learning how to form sentences, pay attention to the lettering. And honestly, recently, I found there are more tools that help dyslexics than there has ever been. Amazon has a font for Kindle that helps people with dyslexia. And that has been invaluable for mm -hmm. me and my, my physical reading. Because paperbacks, I take a really, really, really long time to read. Um, just reading The Hellbound Heart will usually take me about four weeks, maybe a month to get through. And I've read that book cover to cover at least six times. Some of it's because I enjoy reading it, but the other part is because I really do have to slow down. And with the new fonts that they have, I mean, they're designed in such a way that the letters are bigger on top and bottom. So you have to follow the flow of the word because a lot of it's you're seeing the first and last syllable and that's it. You're not seeing the middle portion of the word and you're just making it up as you go sometimes. Like that and Audible have been a huge game changer for me and my consumption of literature and fiction. I last year because of uh, Summer Cannon's podcast. Um, oh my gosh, I totally blanked on that. Um, a case Those for Friday. classics. No, a case for classics. Her book podcast actually got me interested in reading some of the classics because they're in audiobooks. Hmm. So last year, thirty-five was the first time I read Alice in Wonderland or heard Alice in Wonderland, and I almost wept because I'm like, this is right up my alley as a kid. I'm like, I remember being in class trying to read that in the Jabberwocky, and I'm like, put the book down, step back. Nope, I can't get through it. So thanks to things like Audible and how, you know, Kindle has these new fonts, that's been super helpful. But the primary thing is writing. Physically writing words has helped so much with my dyslexia because it's you're learning to put words together and focus on the whole word. When you're editing, you are reading and rereading and rereading, and you're forcing yourself to get faster at it. And that helps. I mean, at least that's what it was for me. Writing was a huge part in getting better at my dyslexia. And it's been really, really good with some of my math stuff too, just the way that I write numbers and more handwriting than physically typing. Cause I'll oh. do a little bit of both. 
I, I just want to touch on two things, Bren. Um, sorry if I'm cutting you off. Uh, the Jabberwocky is hard as shit, whether you're dyslexic or not, because that's just, it's great. It, 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 it elicits so many wonderful creative uh, avenues, but I mean, that that's just not easy in general the first time or second time you got to attack it. But uh, my question is, with Alice in Wonderland, did, did you guys just, did you just read the first one or tackle a look through the looking glass as well i basically just got through the first one for now um just because my tbr pile like everybody else is like a stack of phone books and bibles so i'm getting through it i'd like to know what uh how may you how made you feel because you touched on that which made me think that it just brought you back to you know made you feel like a kid which a lot of great books do but is there anything else that you want to expand on that? If not, it's all, you know, it's all good either way. No, I mean, it just showed me as an adult that even fiction as weird as Alice in Wonderland still has a place in literature. I mean, my writing style itself is a little weird to say the least, but to see that you can form all these weird jumbles of words and make something so beautiful, so poetic, because it is poetry. Hmm. I mean, the Alice in Wonderland is basically poetry. But it's, it just showed me what's still possible and how these types of stories and nonlinear storytelling can, you know, really help just normal fiction. It's just reading widely helps you as a writer in general. And finally being able to catch up on some of this stuff, it makes me feel like there's a lot of other stuff I really need to catch up on. Brennan, take us away, sir. Yeah, I appreciate you, you know, going into that and talking and sharing. I think the font thing on Kindle with the weighted bottoms and tops, that's really, really cool. I mean, we've had a lot of success with just how much text to speech stuff you can do on, you know, his Chromebook, but computers in general. Um, And he when he's reading a book that's not, you know, specifically kind of designed uh, for somebody with dyslexia, Uh, He even just uses like a little tool. It's almost like a little rectangular magnifying glass that he can just go word by word with. Yeah, Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. Some of them have a little, have like a little red dot that kind of helps you follow the words. Yep. Those, those are awesome. Yeah. I mean, he, he got diagnosed when he was in second grade. And I mean, at that point he was reading at like a kindergarten level, but it was, you know, um, a big portion of what helped him besides the tools, you know, I I, I was so psyched to kind of hear you say, well, just writing, you know, just processing words in a variety of different ways. And with handwriting, that was such a helpful tool. And I, I love when aspects like this come up because you never know when we have somebody listening who might be going through these struggles and may even, you know, be undiagnosed and wonder why they, take longer to get through a book than, you know, they go on Twitter and you got people reading 27 a week and why they can't do that. And to kind of have resources within the uh, community, if you will, uh, I I think that's always cool. So thank you for sharing. Uh, Wiley, I want to kick it back to you. I'm, I think it's really, really cool that um, the, one of the first books that really spoke to you uh, was the rising and now, I mean, Brian Keene is a good friend. I mean, how, tell us a little bit about what that's like <laughs> to kind of have this book that really just starts you on a journey. And now, you know, the person that inspired you is a friend. So I was actually in the uh, hospital when I read The Rising. I, I was not having surgery. A friend of mine was. And <clears throat> while they were under, I read that whole book in four hours. And it was like enlightenment happened because I was like, I did not know that you could write this way, that there could be this downer ending where everyone dies and (laughs) that, you know, this visceral, just great story. And so then after that, my parents got so annoyed because every time one, I went to books a million and bought every single one of his books that I could possibly find (laughs) that was there. And then every time he had a new release that I could find, I bought it. Like we were there at midnight getting it because I was like, comes out today. (laughs) <laughs> and my dad, you're driving me 30 miles so I can get this book, okay? Um, so 
that went on for years. And then uh, I was at the time working at the airport, working for uh, United Airlines, and I got to fly for free. And I'd never been to a horror convention ever. And I found out that Brian was going to one, World Horror 2016 in Provo, Utah. And so I was like, cool, I'm going to go do that. It would be cool to actually meet him for once. And I um, – went there and I went, I went to hang out in a bar as one does at a writer convention. And I was just sitting there, you know, and I was, I was like, I don't know anybody here. I don't, I'm going to bring my 11, 22, 63 copy and just, just read it <laughs> sadly at the bar by myself. And, uh, I was noticed, uh, by Linda Addison, who is a phenomenal poet writer in her own right. Hmm. And she, uh, noticed me and just we we hit it off and then while we're sitting there just talking and she was like so who who are you here to see anybody in particular and i was brian i was like i'm here to see brian Keane." and she went oh shoot we know brian before he even was brian we'll we'll introduce you and i <laughs> and my my girlfriend now my wife at the time was like oh you're gonna meet your hero don't nonchalantly lick him will you <laughs> i was like no not not gonna do that and while we're sitting there at the bar, who else wanders up and begins talking to me but Dallas Mayor? Jack oh, 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 that's and, cool. Yeah, and he and hit it off. And uh, so then they all went to bed, and uh, Richard Lehman's daughter, Kelly, stayed up with me until Brian got there at like one in the morning. <laughs> wow. And uh, Kelly apparently wandered up to him and whispered in his ear, he's like, he was you when you met dad. And then she left. And so Brian then sat and talked with me for an hour. And then that just, we've become friends after that, you know, in the, in public, private, doesn't matter. I, I like, I've always called him sensei. So that's his, <laughs> that's his nickname for me. Uh, that's my nickname for him. But our relationship I've always said is a lot. If y'all ever watched scrubs is a lot like uh, Dr. Cox and Jay. <laughs> <laughs> like Brian will be walking through the convention. And I'll be like, Hey, sensei. He's like, dear God, newbie, where'd you come from? <laughs> so, it, but it's been fun, I, and we've gotten to that. We've gotten to that level where you know now I'll, I'll, I'll give him, you know, I'll give him crap about whatever. But I have a deep and abiding respect and awe for him. So, I, I think it's fair to say that you're, you could very likely be at that point yourself now, Wiley. Um, just on the magpie coffin alone, uh, Brennan. I want to go in that direction, so I don't want to hijack your thing. Is this? Do you have any other follow up to? Yeah, I want to throw one out real quick. You you said when you read The Rising, like you kind of looked at it as you didn't know you could write that way. Had you experimented with writing at all before that, or did that kind of light a spark? Yeah, uh, I had experimented with writing before that. Now, none of it is ever going to see the light of day. No <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it was about. I'm not going to tell you, like, you know. I get that. Like, like we're, we're talking, it's like the, the uh, I'll tell you the one, the first one that I had started writing, uh, which took like s- six years to complete, but it had like 50 characters from first and third person perspective. The monsters talked in different fonts. <laughs> the, and I, I, when I put the final period on that thing, I was like, oh man, this is genius. This is it. This is the one. It is art. And anyway, that thing needs to be burned. It's burned and done away with. But I still have a copy of it. And my wife likes to make fun of me from time to time about it. I don't think I've ever mentioned this. I don't even know if I told Brennan privately, but my wife used to be my first reader and she doesn't read anything now. And I, I don't blame her. I have no ill feelings towards that. I know some writers do, but um, there's a point when I still was super new and I was, so this is almost 10 years ago, where I mixed up my, <laughs> I would mix up my tenses because I just didn't get it at that point. Like I need to learn rudimentary uh composition and just generally how to write in the english language when you're writing prose um because it, it's it's a craft and a lot of people just don't think it is but that's a whole nother topic and the last short story she read she got maybe a page in and said i'm done i can't i can't read this this is just uh, it's unreadable um i got stories like that too and that's what it made me think of it's just funny now because if you stick to it and this is kind of a theme on the show i guess now nowadays where if you just stick to something 
right in, then it, it, you know you can only go up from where you, from where you are today. I always say the more of it, the more of it you do, the more you'll learn, the better you'll get, and eventually it's all an endurance game, and yeah. you'll eventually succeed at it. So you both, it's funny that you both talked about classic books, and um, I'd like to for you, Eileen. Um, how young were you when you started reading Dracula and in, in uh, Frankenstein? I don't know if you mentioned it. I, I can't recall you saying an age. Uh, nine or ten years old. Wow. Okay. So, um, aren't both of those books? Oh, wow. The word slipped in my mind. Um, letter format. Uh, help me out. Four writers here. Someone can think of the name. Epistolary. <laughs> there it yeah. is. Epistolary. Was that, I feel like that would have bore the pants off of me at that age. How was well, it for you? Considering that uh, my grandfather is a preacher and I had an extensive biblical education, I had read several epistolary books <laughs> at that point. <laughs> okay. But, 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 this, but this one involved vampires unless, it, you know, God is mad at Israel. Okay, fair enough. So I do want to talk about the magpie coffin. No secret to you, I, I absolutely love it. And um, I'm going to keep this super short. I'm not going to ask you to expand with any questions, but the short story in Hot Iron and Cold Blood, it's very exciting. It, it, if you like the magpie coffin, um, I, it's basically an extension of that. It's just uh, <laughs> it's lean, mean, and it's just fast paced. Um, so with the magpie coffin, was that the first Western you ever tackled? Yes, I, I started another one, started two actually that I never got around to finishing. It just never clicked, but the, this was the fir first one that I started and I actually finished and it was, it was a lot of fun to do. And now, you know, as most things do, when the train left the station, it's time to, it's, it's time to plan the rest of the railroad as it were. <laughs> Brennan, you got any questions for this particular book? Because um, I, I could go in so many you can, directions. You can you can ask some questions. I don't care, as long as it's nothing plot critical. I, I'll I'll give you the if it is, but if it's <laughs> I'll answer. You know. So what I'm curious about, I know that when um, uh, fill in the blanks for me, but when Death's Head Press started this line, uh, they brought in you know some authors had had you kind of pitch a book or they pitched it to you and they wanted novella length stuff correct right or thereabouts well, they wanted that and then christopher triana threw it out the window so yeah so I, I would uh if that wasn't um kind of a guideline would magpie coffin have been longer did you actively try it to keep it right around 200 it, it no, because it was it was originally only supposed to be forty thousand a novella, and it's fifty four thousand. Mm. So even I even I just went oh, ten thousand over, and I said you get what you get, <laughs> and that was number one. Yeah. So I mean, where I'm going with that is the 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 second book is nearly twice the size. So I was wondering, you know, what was your approach for that to, you know, take take this story that is about fifty four thousand words and beef up the sequel to to that extent um that's the nature of sequels they have to be big, bigger better more teeth as it were but also magpie is it's no secret that it is it, it's it's lean it gives you the barest information it dro drops you in in media rest you have no idea who this man is you have no idea what his motivations are it's literally star wars a new hope <laughs> we're dropping <laughs> you in on episode, we're dropping you in on star wars episode four you know where you have no idea of his backstory and it's supposed to be that way i saw a lot i saw you know some reviews they're like i wish we it's like my complaint is that we didn't know anything about him like that's the point you're not supposed to know anything about him and you're supposed to learn about him through his actions and deeds through this book so for souls the the sequel it is it's twice as long because not only do do sequels have to be bigger and you know sharper more teeth but also you get more of his backstory more of his motivations for things not a full picture, but four pieces to the puzzle than you got in the first go around. That makes sense. I um, <laughs> I'll just say this: the part with the son and mother, um, 
there's a lot of parts where I, I, there's certain books where if it's audio, just like you, Lucas, um, I think it's ADHD related. It could be another aspect, but I have not read a physical book all year. It's been audio and voice to text. I, I don't know why, but this year just, I hate it. Cause I love physical books, but anyways, um, there were a lot of parts where I would rewind and just listen to because of how you were things. It's similar to Joe Lansdale's style of writing in the sense where it's, it's a lot of really excellent work. Like you have good word choices and sure. Like what writer doesn't aspire for that, but it, it, it's the sequence you put them in where it's just, it's seriously action packed when you describe someone getting shot. There's a lot of ways you could write that, but the way you write it is interesting because you focus on like an exit wound that explodes, you know, pulp or whatever. I, I'm clearly not as good at this as you are, but uh, <laughs> my point is, is uh, one of the scenes was the mother and daughter, uh, the mother and son scene towards the, I think it's like three quarters in. Uh, does that ring a bell in the basement? The badass. Yeah. The, the middle, the craft. That's it. I just thought that was so, and there's a pig head in that too. I just thought that was so fun. That 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 kind of had some Lucas. Uh, <laughs> I see smiling some Lucas remnants in there, but I just want to know with stuff like that, is there particular influences that you use from a movie or a few mu- movies that uh, that you kind of put into your own work? Like, is there any one or two? maybe creators that you can think of that kind of um, that might rub off on you in the best of ways. Oh yeah. I mean, who doesn't have the creators they look up to, but like Brian, Brian and Lansdale, obviously. Yeah. Those, yeah. Those, those are two, like, you know, you go with the, the OG weird Western writer pretty much. And, and Brian, he speaks for himself and, you know, uh, Dallas mayor, Jack catch him that, that, he has a precise brutality about him. You just can't, you can't replicate. It was just sure, sure. <laughs> leave you crying at the end of it. And uh, Jesus Gonzalez, he his stuff just, you know, the sheer <laughs> the sheer amount of just insanity. Once you thought he had pushed it as far as it can go, we're we're going further. We're we're on the roller coaster ride. So hold your hold your hand there, but. The ones that uh, were specifically for that were old, like, folk magic and myths and symbolism metaphor kind of things. Because it's like, you know, the pig head thing specifically that you mentioned. It's it's the symbolic of uh, the person who did this thinks of them as an animal, so they're going to make them as close to an animal as possible. You know, the to symbolically, this is how I see you. That makes sense. Yeah. So... That there's a lot of like with mag with magpie this whole saga with salem he uh there's a lot of just metaphor and like things things have deeper me- meanings than, than you see or but it's all real uh sh- sham- shaman like and mystic kind of thing but but the barest touch i never really would, people are like i don't like it when the, the wizard or whatever just throws the flat out fireball i I like the kind of stuff that the world, the magic barely touches on the world and you aren't quite sure whether it's something more. That's great. Uh, No, I would honestly describe your writing style as honest. There's a lot of people who write very wordy prose, but Wiley, you are a very, you write what you need to write. And, you know, I've been reading you since uh, Catfish in the Cradle Mm -hmm. and you do have a distinct style that mirrors a little bit of uh, Jack Ketchum and, and uh, oh my God, why the hell did I just face in that? Lansdale. Brian. Lansdale. Well, yeah, no, everyone says Lansdale, but I think that's the Southern thing because it's the same thing with you, with, you know, Ronald Kelly. I see a lot of that in you. I mean, you're just, your pros are very honest in that way that you don't overwrite. And it's very good. I like, uh, Thank you, Lucas. I really appreciate it. But I'd like to also give props to my wife because she is my editor and she is a heck of an editor. And she will put in the notes, you're overriding, do away with this. And stuff like uh, one note, my favorite note she ever left me was, this sentence is a bigger train wreck than the one in this story. (laughs) (laughs) 
so <laughs> being an official, like I've edited before, but I've always viewed it as beta reading, but Brennan and I were talking and him and I give extensive notes and it's hard to find good editor, beta readers or whatever like that. Um, and for a note that your wife left, I, that's funny as hell. Me personally, I just want to throw my two cents in there. I want to leave that for you or Lucas or many people at this point. You got to get to a comfort, at least with me. It's all different for everyone. Some people are like, I don't give a shit. But for me, I, I would just be too nervous to do that with most people right now. That's funny, though. I'm I'd see. imagine he's more comfortable getting notes from his wife than from you. Oh, he <laughs> No competition. <laughs> Beauty and the Beast. So, Lucas, we asked Will, uh, why, Will, Wiley. Man, my brain is fartastic today. We asked Wiley about his influences. I want to hear about yours. Well, I mean, I always go back to Clyde Barker. I mean, he's the reason that I write. Um, that, makes, you know, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, Thief of Always at a young age, you know, that was a great story. But the one that got me writing was the, the Hellbound Heart. I mean, the opening sentence is engraved in my brain. So intent was Frank upon solving the puzzle of the Marchand's box that he didn't hear the great bell begin to ring. You know, I love it because it is flower, but it gets to the point very quickly. Hmm. Um, you know, I was reading a lot of him. I was reading a lot of Stephen King. I mean, I didn't find a lot of influence in Stephen King because I felt Stephen King would over describe a postcard you know or he would go too much into backstory which i'm like okay get to the good stuff you're about to murder people but it was a lot of that i mean that and another book um and i can never remember the author's name but i remember the series uh do any of you guys remember a book series called the animorphs <laughs> k.a applegate yes Animorphs is great animorphs was awesome but she had a pen name Oh. For a book series called Barforama. <laughs> it was of the same age range for books. And the first book of hers that I read was under her pen name. And it was Patricia or Patrick something. And it was called The Great Puke Off. And it was literally just a gross out story about kids trying to, you know, out gross out the other kids. And obviously that stuck. I mean, it's between that, it's between video games. You know, I was a hardcore horror gamer, everything from Shadow Man to all the Silent Hill games. Uh, never got into Resident Evil because I was too much of a first-person shooter, but it was a lot of that stuff. And lastly was music. Um, as a musician, I was hardcore into atmospheric progressive metal like Tool and Dream Theater and Opeth. And lyrically and atmospherically inspired a lot of my writing. And, you know, we all rip off little pieces of stuff that's around us. And between all of that and life experience, yeah, I write fucked up shit. So I just looked it up. Uh, Barf O Rama is a series of children novels by Pat Polari. Yes. No, no, wrong. that's, yeah, no, that, that sounds right. Yeah, that's her. I don't know if I'm gonna, uh, pronouncing the last name right by K.A. Mm -hmm. Applegate. So they're... <laughs> It's just going to, let me just read a few the of the cover, the covers, the, the covers, covers. Are wonderful. a boy taking a bite of a burrito with cockroaches coming out. <laughs> what? <laughs> one of the titles is pig breath. Another one is splat in the hat or the splat in the hat. Jurassic <laughs> farts. Another one, um, ham booger, booger and French flies. Man, that's a tongue twister. But the funniest one to me is to we or not to we. It's just like someone's getting paid. Not only to write mm -hmm. this shit, but like to write 17 of them. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was her passion project outside of the Animorphs. I mean, a Nickelodeon TV show came out of this. Oh, the, anim saying, the Animorphs, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All I'm saying about Kay Applegate and Animorphs, people, you think it's just this like children's show, but or children's book series, but we're, we introduced body horror, war crimes. They're Ooh, really a lot of body for, a, for a, a children's series. And I was reading it that in was. fourth grade. Oh, it totally was. I mean, the whole or, thing of like, if you don't change back, oh God. Yeah. Or were they, were they deliberately trap that guy in the body of a rat? And then mm -hmm. like for months afterward, they can hear him screaming in their head from very far away. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it, 
it was a lot more fucked up than people gave it credit for. But I mean, it's kind of like when you look back and watch Ren and Stimpy of the same era and you're like, this was a kid show. Mine yes. was my favorite one growing up was Rocco's Modern Life. And absolutely. Look, looking Chunky back, chicken. <laughs> looking back. The chunky yes. chicken. Invader Zim. Invader Zim. Mm-hmm. I'm going to sing the theme song. And, and um, <laughs> the one where Zim's going around stealing everybody's organs. Yes, the organs. Or the one with the moose, and he's just throwing moose into the time machine, and he keeps <laughs> no, it's up piggy. the time. The, the, the piggies, the piggies, piggies. Was, uh, the moose was uh, the, yes. the moose, it was a room with the moose, and that was the it. The room with the moose, yes. Room with the moose. But yeah, the it's, pigs. Throwing the, the pigs. The show used to creep me out as, a, well, whatever, well, whatever age I was. Well, for me, it was a uh, it was Joan and Vasquez's other project, which was the comic series, Joni, the Homicidal Maniac. Oh, yeah. That was twisted. I'm not Killed familiar with that. Oh, my God. Johnny, the Homicidal Maniac. It introduced a character named Squee. And I've taken bits and pieces of Squee in some of my stuff. But it's just the sheer randomness of words that Squee just spits out. Um, Happy Noodle Boy, all that stuff. Uh, Johnny, the Homicidal Maniac is definitely a comic strip worth, worth getting. It's just a graphic novel. Wicked crazy fucked up. These are new names to me. They sound fucked up. Mm-hmm. Uh- <laughs> so, um, Brent, uh, Brent, you want to lead us into the uh, Southern writer thing? That was kind of your idea. So I'd love to hear where you take that. Yeah, I mean, you both are from Southern states, uh, albeit in different parts of the country. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how maybe that plays into your writing. Uh, Wiley, why don't you start? All right. So uh, currently I live in Oklahoma, a.k.a. the armpit of America, but I grew up in uh, East Texas. Um, so people think of Texas and they think, you know, the West, they think of West Texas, horses and oil and desert. East Texas is actually uh, pine tree forests and uh, swamps. And so that's the area I grew up in. And I grew up with within 30 minutes of where the Texarkana Moonlight murders took place, 15 minutes of the Falk monster. So, and the, Jefferson, Texas, which is only like 20 minutes away is, from where I grew up, is the Bigfoot capital of like the South. More Bigfoot signings around that area than any other. So I grew up surrounded by like ghost stories and monsters and, you know, horrifying stuff. And but the environment there is what really affected me. I just love that that endless pine forest. And I grew up on this lake, which is more of a swamp and uh, would go fishing there all the time and. That really affected me. Catfish in the Cradle takes place entirely there. And with, you know, with the appropriate names chiseled off. Great. But it's great. Lucas, how about you? Well, you I'm know, glad Floridian. you. <laughs> well, I'm glad you started with the guy with the Southern accent. Because um, <laughs> the thing with living in Florida is we're usually not considered the South where I live because it's mostly people from New York and New Jersey and West Palm. Um, oh, only dicks I mean, live in New Jersey Yeah, and then they retire to Boca <laughs> So I have to deal with them on I-95 But no, I mean, I grew up in Florida um, I was actually born near Ocala Which is the middle of fucking nowhere uh, You basically have more alligators than people And I was raised in the West Palm Beach area uh, I mean, what else can I say about Florida? We are America's uncut cock it's this is the place where fucking crystal meth wasn't good enough. So they invented flocka and bath salts. <laughs> I mean, it lives up to its hype. I mean, Florida is just a wild, wild state. I grew up seeing I remember driving down Congress Avenue and you couldn't drive 20 feet without counting three alligators on the side of the road. Um, it's just the Everglades has always been part of my life growing up. I've always been camping. I've spent a lot of time out in airboat riding and all that stuff when I was a kid. Um, yeah, no, this place is, I mean, hashtag Florida, man. Seriously. Andrew Jackson was the one that got uh, this country, Florida. And uh, random fact, I know I'm going, you know, I'm mm-hmm. going off left field. And uh, by that point, he was so just beat because he would he would actually walk with his troops uh, hundreds of miles and be like one of the 
one of the you know soldiers and he was so he was so aged for his position he had like a, a bullet lodged in his body still he was so withered down that he, he could never move on to the next body of uh land that he wanted to get which was cuba which would be a real interesting because uh going back in the 1800s if he had achieved that then you know that that would totally defeat a lot of things. I mean, think about the Castro yeah, period. That'd be pretty weird. Well, I mean, well, more than just that, I mean, think of all the people that came to Florida looking for the fountain of youth. I mean, you can say that still happens today when people retire here. Everybody <laughs> comes, everybody ends up in Florida at some point. I mean, we're the state that gave you NSYNC, Britney Spears, Marilyn Manson, Cannibal Corpse, and Jimmy Buffett. You're welcome, America. <laughs> What the fuck? That is such a random group of people. It is, but that's what you expect from, you know, America's uncut cock. Florida does have a really interesting history with uh, with heavy metal in particular. Oh, especially the West Coast. I mean, again, the West Coast is where you get bands like Morbid, uh, not Morbid Angel, but Cannibal Corpse especially. I mean, they invented that hardcore <laughs> death metal <y> stuff. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where we go from there. So, Wiley, why don't you take over? I'll say here in Oklahoma, we have a less of an enlightened view of Andrew Jackson. Yeah, well, <laughs> I didn't say he was a good guy. You know, he, yeah. just, to, just to be clear. because not, not, uh, not only are, you know, uh, First Nations individuals being forced out of their ancestral homes, they're being forced to go to Oklahoma. So, <laughs> Well, he killed, I think, the Trail of Tears. I might be low on this number, but I know it was like 17,000 Native Americans that were killed just uh, on that walk. They were treated. They, yeah, look at, yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> they were they were not treated well. He was a psycho, man. He was a yeah. serial. Andrew Jackson was a serial duelist at, at a time where dueling really wasn't a thing anymore. And um, he he just he just got a some kind of sick kick out of it. Um, and his wife was a lot older than him um and it was kind of viewed not in a great light society like on a societal level and uh you wouldn't want to be caught talking shit about her because he was seriously tapped in the head i still love it though he had like 200 duels and on his deathbed said he should have like had someone shot for treason should have hanged someone else i was like in a lifetime of killing people his last wish was that he hadn't killed more people yeah yeah he wanted to hang his own vice president um and one other thing is he, there's an assassination attempt on him. The guns were after inspected and they were working fine, but they both just jammed for no, no one could figure out why. So Andrew Jackson at that time had a cane and uh, he, he, he beat the living hell out of, of the would be assassin and had his own men rip him off of him. Otherwise he was literally going to beat him to death. Which I mean, I don't blame him in that situation, but he was just uh he was a crazy motherfucker. Basically. All right, that's it, folks. Have a good night. <laughs> um, Brennan, I, I would I would like to go one way, but I wanna I wanna see which way you go. I got so derailed when you gave us a 20 minute lecture on Andrew Jackson. <laughs> you take it wherever you want, man. I, I, got, I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> So, Lucas, you and I, and tell me if you want to cut this part, but I did think it was kind of interesting. Um, you and I had a talk off air. I, I don't know when it was. It was a while ago where you've been accused of being like a straight white guy um, mm-hmm. si- simply for whatever the content was. And this is this is not unique to just you. This is something that happens probably on a daily basis. Eric Larocca is another good example where he got accused of. Oh, I've it, been. It shouldn't. Oh. It shouldn't. My no. opinion is it shouldn't fucking matter for the most part. Yeah. I mean, and this is, I mean, if people not watching video of this and who don't know what I look like can, I mean, I grew up, everyone thought it was Asian because of my squinty eyes. And of course I sucked at math. So they'd fail their math tests. And the joke always was, well, it's because Mexicans don't know math. We can multiply, but that's about it. Oh, my God. We can't but, say that joke on air. We would get probably, canceled. But, I mean, the thing is, is I always grew up, everybody assumes what I am or who I am 
But it's the same thing like anybody online. I look at online as you're walking into a dive bar. You're not going to take the angry drunk at the end of the bar for his word. He's at a bar. He's drunk. He's stoned off his mind. You don't know where the hell he's been. (laughs) The only difference between that and the Internet is I don't have to smell these people. I mean, but that's basically how I treat the Internet these days. It's you're going into a dive bar. Just keep your hands in your pockets and, you know, have fun while you're in there and get out. Just be responsible. You know, keep your shit to yourself at this point. I every time I go on, every time I go to the online dive bar, I just sing piano man until people leave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, did you have any negative blowback, Wiley, on uh, on any of your books thus far? Not yet. Uh, I'm assume I'm assuming it's going to happen, but that I for one of, for one of those things, like I have no prejudices towards anybody at the end of the day we're all we're all in the same boat and it's sinking yeah <laughs> and so yeah so uh i, I don't i don't have anything oh. against anybody for anything unless you the only thing i have uh, trouble with are people who are intolerant towards others and zealots yes of any kind i hate zealotry of any form or flavor i'm like mm-hmm. dude, I, I found a lot about you know growing up then you know the whole love thy neighbor I found out a lot that loving my neighbor is really not giving a crap what your neighbor does. Yeah. Yeah. No shit. What I, what I go ahead, Lucas. Oh no. I was going to say that um, for me, prejudice is a little weird because I actually was really big into the kink scene, the BDSM scene down in Fort Lauderdale for a good portion of my adolescence. And you learn not to kink shame because what's weird to you is normal to someone else. That's true. And, And that's just kind of how I look at everything. It's, you know, some people love butt stuff. Some people like oral. Some people like, you know, water sports. I'm not going to judge you. Just do what you do. It doesn't matter what your race, creed, or color, because what you're going to do behind closed doors ain't much different than what I might like. That is true. Some people might like all three at the same time. Oh, I've met them. I've met them. (laughs) And you said Fort Lauderdale, and I've I've been there. It And so there was a club called Fetish Factory. Um, well, not a club. It's a clothing store, and they host fetish parties. And we have this gentleman who would go there. We all know he's an attorney because we've seen his face on many of billboards. <laughs> I had taken one of my friends to, you know, the first fet- his first fetish party, and we're walking into the men's room. And at fetish parties, they were co-ed bathrooms because you. this was back in 2010. So this is before the big LGBT trans community really came out of the closet. This is, you know, everybody was still a little quiet about it. And having co-ed bathrooms, especially at a fetish party, was a little different for people. And we walk into the men to the men's room, in quotations, and there is Mr. Gentleman. He wears, anytime you would see him, he wore nothing but whitey tighties with the letters CBT written on his chest with a length of rope coming out the side of his underwear. Now, for those in the listening audience who don't know what CBT stands for, stands for cock and ball torture. So, oh. so there is a dominatrix in ballerina style stilettos standing on his crotch with a riding prop smacking him in the face. And my friend is like, what the fuck? And I'm like, shut up. He's smiling. Leave. <laughs> and that's how I take life. I mean, look, they're smiling. They're happy. They might not be happy, but let's pretend and walk away. Do you never think Andrew Jackson would have thought that this would have come up in a whole stream involving him? <laughs> no, <laughs> but I'm 180. That's for sure. <laughs> no, but I, I'm glad it did. Exactly. Uh, I think he like cock and ball torture. <laughs> well, that's why whenever I write stuff that's Lovecraft in- inspired, there's always a gay guy, there's always a black guy, and there's always a Jew. Anytime I write Lovecraft, I throw in as much cultural diversity as possible because I didn't like how he treated those cultures. And here's a way to make it better. Victor Laval does that too. Not the, oh, I, not the oh, way you does, would, but <laughs> no, but Laval, oh my God, he does it brilliantly. I mean, the Ballad of Black Tom is yes. fantastic. That's the first book, the first story I read by him, I forgot the title was when Weird Tales came back with Jonathan Mayberry. Um, mm-hmm. in it, and I was just blown away. And then I read the Black uh, Ballad of Tom. Uh, I butchered that title, didn't I? The Ballad, the Ballad of Black, Black Tom. Tom. 
Yeah, yeah. all the words were in there. Yeah, I got all yeah. the words right, just the wrong order. Um, I hope you found this funny, Lucas. Mm-hmm. I had a dyslexic moment. There you go. Oh, thank God that wasn't bad taste for you. <laughs> Brennan's oh. like, yeah, you got lucky. <laughs> um, Talking to me about taste. I just threw myself off. Wow, guys, they're never want to, They will never want to no. come back. No, but the changeling was my first of his, and oh my god, some of the my favorite line to this day of that book was: "We used to let the vampires had to knock before we let them in. Now we invite them with a friend's request or something to that level." And I was just like, "Oh shit, that hit." Yeah, I can't. He's got a book coming out next year, and I'm very excited for that. Um. I mean, to this day, I still want him and Maurice Broaddus to collaborate. That would be in a fantastic book collaboration. Has that been talked about? No, but I throw it out into the universe every opportunity I get because I want that to happen. (laughs) Uh, We have not talked really about your book, so you can tell us about Cocksucker. That's the title. It's not about fetishes. Knob Gobbler. Knob Gobbler. It's just just about Keaton. (laughs) or Or as Drew Stepik on Godless says, Cucks, what is it, a cocksucker? I don't know. It's now there's two ways you can describe cocksucker. It's bath salts, Bigfoot. <laughs> I mean, that's the quick sell. Or it's the boy who lost his dog story. Only the boy happens to be an emperor redneck. The dog mm-hmm. happens to be a chupacabra. They get lost in the Everglades. There's a bisexual named uh, skunk ape named Curious Old Bob because, well, he's bi curious. Shenanigans ensue. But at its heart, it's a love story. Um, I mean, yes, it is probably the book that I am most well known for. And the funny part was it was actually kind of a, a love letter and a joke about Florida. Because it's 100% <laughs> unadulterated Florida man without a hashtag Florida man situation. I love how when Brian King show was on that, that was the ad that played the absolute most at the end of the run. And I want to yeah. know how I, if you're not comfortable sharing this, that's fine. But how much money did you spend, man? Cause that had to be a lot. It, I wanted to get the most bang for my buck because it is physically impossible to advertise that book on any other platform other than podcasts. <laughs> so I mean, did you think about this while you were titling it? Sort of. Um, The book came first and then the title came about two thirds of the way through. And it was sort of my second working title because the first title was just the Blue Crab. Um, Blue Crab is an actual restaurant in South Florida. And for those of you who've read Cocksucker, Clive's family own a restaurant called the Red Crab. And the bathrooms are plastered with soft pornography. Mm -hmm. That's actually based off a real restaurant where they're bathroom is actually covered with soft pornography and it's a family restaurant called the blue crab look them up their frog legs are delicious what the best frog legs i've had i feel like lots of those words are not real but you just said they are and it's in florida but yes that's like a florida story where it's just but that's the magic of this state because you can say some of the weirdest things bath salt zombie in miami eats man's face (laughs) It's, it's like it's yeah. like it's like the pre-Trump era as president. Um, well, I mean, uh, this is they, the ma- I mean, my thing I'll tell people is they come for the mouse, they come for Disney, but they stay for the mess. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that it, it seems like the pre-Trump era where everything that seemed ridiculous was like on the onion. But nowadays, since there's a president it, that was a yeah. fucking clown. It's hard to differentiate between, you know, what's real and what's just someone being an asshole. And I don't and, know. I don't know anymore. Kind of, but that's kind of how I like to write my fiction. It's every book that I've written has parts of myself, parts of my own personality and truth to it. Every book has something true that has ever happened to me. Um, I'm not going to tell you what that is in Cocksucker. You'll have to read it. <laughs> But everything from the dead heart has a lot of my BDSM lifestyle. Uh, that's coming out sometime in October. I want to say October 7th. Um, Is that the one I read? The first like uh, two chapters, I think it was the old, the, the older couple. You, you mm-hmm. sent it, you sent it like months and months ago. 
I don't know if it was that one. I can't remember off the top of my head which one I sent you, but no, the Dead Heart. It's uh, basically the story of two resurrectionists, one accidental and one's more of a necrophiliac necromancer. Hmm. Uh, definitely, yeah. A lot of the BDSM stuff comes out in that particular story. But uh, what is it? Skin Deep was something that I did for the Godless website. Uh, Fucking Scumbags Burn in Hell series. <laughs> um, that is probably the most personal of my stories because I'm not going to tell the audience members which one. They, again, you have to read it. It's only 50 cents on Godless. But it basically, it's the story about my own trauma. I had written that story after my biological father passed away who was just a despicable human being towards me. I, I didn't have any relationship with him after the age of 12, but my relationship with him was very abusive and very hurtful. And when he passed away, I went about a month without writing, which is unusual for me because ever since I was around 12 years old, I've always worked on stories, whether it's a sentence a day, editing a day, but I've never gone a day without writing, no more than three days in a row without writing. And to have gone a whole month after this man passed away, I'm like, I, I, I've got to be done. Maybe I don't have anything left to write. And then when Drew Stepick gave me the opportunity to write in this fucking scumbags burn in hell, he said, find someone deplorable and punish them. And then I looked inward and I said, well, what am I most afraid of? Well, I'm afraid of turning into my father. And I went literal and I went just absolute. I threw all of my trauma in those 17,000 words. And it is probably the darkest thing I've ever read and the most cathartic. But everything has that. Timmy Less is about my repressed memories from when I was 12 years old and younger dealing with my biological father. Um, Lost Words in a Dream is cosmic horror about repressed memories and about what happens when those memories surface. So everything, even becoming, there's, I've never been, and this may sound out of left field, but we're talking about trauma here. I've never been a suicidal person. And the reason I've never been a suicidal person is because of writing. I, my family had gone through some really crazy hardships. There was a moment where the five of us were homeless for about six months. And that was the one time I'd contemplated it. So I wrote it down. And I just didn't like how it ended. And I decided I'm not going to. Yeah. And I decided that this isn't what I'm going to do. And I'd held on to that little piece of fiction for a very long time. And then I was writing the series Becoming. And there is a moment when Cody, you know, has to confront a bully. And I use it. I use word for word exactly what I wrote when I was 16 about what I was feeling in that moment. And it needed to be in there. So everything that I've written, as wild, crazy, and fucked up as it is, there's always something coming out of it that is from the heart. And it's always something that I've experienced. So that, that's my writing style. As weird and crazy and fucked up as it is, it's, there's always something, there's always that kernel of truth. And there's always something positive behind it. That's why all my Florida man fiction from Meth Gator to Sea Cow has a happy ending. God damn, man. That's I'm glad you're here. Okay. <laughs> Thank first you. And foremost. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to segue into anything else. So I'll just say the first time I met Lucas, <laughs> 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 you and Wiley were your tables were next to each other at Scares of Care. Rest in peace, Scares of Care. Um, and Rest in power. Yeah, Rest in right. power. It was like within minutes of getting there, I, I met you guys, and that was really cool. Um, so I just wanted to throw it out there because, like I said, don't know how to segue from that. That was powerful, and that was honest, and I think it's beautiful. And I hope that that uh, makes some people want to buy Cocksucker because that would make me want to buy it if I didn't have it. So what do you guys? <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm over here with uh, Magpie Coffin. It's about a cowboy and he kills people. <laughs> And that's it. <laughs> There's a kernel of truth in there for everyone. I mean, don't get me wrong. People get blown away in cocksucker. <laughs> you guys should write. <laughs> you, you, Lucas, you should take. 
Salem Covington story and put it in your own coming of age. Well, no. <laughs> well, in all honesty, I Brennan and shaking I, his head. Well, I've talked to other writers about this, but at some point, and it will have to be under a pen name, but I do plan on writing children's books and they will be nothing like my adult fiction. Sorry. At all. I, I, at I, all. I believe. I you. know. I know. No, I really look. I'm not saying look, <laughs> I, I love yeah. when an author or an artist does a 180. I'm only mm-hmm. laughing because it's just of the context and the contents we were just talking about. Yes. And then you're like, I'm going to write children's books. I believe in you. You're a damn good writer, but that was just funny. Mm-hmm. So, Wiley, what are you currently reading? <laughs> I am uh, reading three things currently. Uh, so my wife and I are bouncing Fairy Tale by Stephen King back, back and forth to each other. Like I'll read a hundred pages and then stop and then she'll catch up and or vice versa. Then uh, I'm reading Killer of Giants by Stephen Shrewsbury to uh, kind of prepare myself for this uh, sword and sorcery story I have to write. And then I'm reading this new weird Western that involves a noose, if you will, by Brennan LaFaro. Oh, Oh, that's awesome, I man. I hope you uh, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just started it like yesterday, so I'll, I'll give you a I'll, I'll give you a heads up when it's over. All right. I won't be sitting here freaking out at all. That's cool. So. <laughs> Lucas, what are you currently reading? Uh, so right now I'm listening to Bishop by uh, Candace, uh, Candace Knoll. Um, that one I'm actually enjoying quite a lot. I'm also reading Till We Become Monsters by Amanda Headley. Um, then I'm going to do, what was this one? Answers of Silence from Jeff Cooper. It's a short story collection from Jeff Cooper. This was a Brian Keene suggestion. So I'm like, if he says it, you got to read it. That is an awesome collection. Yeah, that's, the, I mean, the forward from J.F. Gonzalez, I read through that and I'm like, oh shit, this is going to be cool. <laughs> that was good. The last thing I finished reading is a book called Pimp by Iceberg Slim. Uh, basically, the story of a guy who was a pimp back in the, um, oh my God, during World War II era. Really fascinating book. Super well-written. Deplorable human. But, oh my God, it's a fascinating read. It's, I like the nickname, Iceberg Slim. No, it's... Highly recommend it, but just remember it is a book of the times and the things Iceberg did to those women is deplorable, but it is beautifully written prose. I get that. Uh, Brennan, what are you currently reading, sir? I am reading a couple things. Uh, I am reading First Blood by David Morrell, the, the first Rambo book. I had never picked that up before. Uh, I haven't watched the movie in a long time, but the, the book is pretty wildly different uh and we're gonna get to talk to david in a couple weeks which is pretty awesome dude's kind of a legend uh i am also reading for the first time the magic wagon by mr lansdale oh Uh, and i cannot believe it took me so long to get to this one but i'm here i mean it's you know it's good it's 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 (laughs) weird it's uh i mean just the first line of this book Wild Bill Hickok, some years after he was dead, came to Mud Creek for a shootout of sorts. I was there. Let me tell you about it. I mean, if that doesn't draw you in, I mean, you're hopeless. Um, I mean, yeah. The first the first line of Bubba Hotep is Elvis dreams he had his dick out, checking to see if the bump on the head of it had filled with pus again. (laughs) (laughs) So that's a, a hook of a different sort. <laughs> hey, not any worse than Ed Lee's The Pig. Uh, yeah. Even the, even the pig was appalled. I don't think you would mind me saying this on this. Yeah, right? I don't think you'd mind me saying this on here, but Keith Lansdale was tell, telling me that when him and his dad write together, they have this phrase when they go too far. It's simply this, that uh, it's 2-2. Because uh, they both get carried away. So that's their phrase to say, hey, Pump the brakes. <laughs> and I would like to see what Joe Lansdale getting too carried away is because I thought I've read it in a few books, but in only the most complimentary of ways. Um, I am almost halfway through How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix. It's creepy as fuck. Uh, it's really good. 
Um, I'm just going to leave it there. It's a haunted house. I mean, like the title says it all. It, it's a haunted house book, but it's it's a lot more than that. The supernatural elements um, just feel like his, what I assume to be inspiration from a few different books from the 60s and 70s. It's 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 super well written. It's great. So I'll just leave it there. Really good. Um, and then I'm actually also reading For a Few Souls More by Wiley Young, book two in uh, Magpie Coffin. Um, I'm only in five chapters worth, but I, I like it, man. It's awesome. It's another continuation to uh, Salem. And um, I, I'm really interested to see where that goes. Uh, <laughs> Wiley, where can people follow you or find you? Well, they can fo- uh, follow me on. I've got my Facebook. I've got my Twitter Twitter, which is uh, at Texas Cthulhu. So you know, t- tune in there to see me uh, routinely, you know, smash trolls on Reddit, that kind of thing. <laughs> what about you, Lucas? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Bearded Optician. You can find me on Instagram, uh, Lucas.Milliron. Facebook, just type my name. Uh, last name is M I L L I R O N, Mill Iron. So just Google me, you'll find me. That's a sweet last name. Brennan, where can people follow you? Uh, Brennan LaFaro, because I, I don't know, like I, I, I appreciated that we had both of you on and you both have uh, usernames on Twitter that make you slightly more difficult than average to find. But I like it. Google. It works. That's Pierre McDonough. I don't know. It's pretty yeah. easy. Unless you know how to fuck up my last name, which a lot of people in Jersey actually are pretty good at not saying or spell my last name right um lucas do you have any final thoughts um no not really i would just say thank you guys for having us on there it's always a pleasure talking chilling i mean you know day jobs with all of us i'm sure it's nice to talk shop every now and then it's it's always a pleasure yeah and uh, it's worth noting that uh for those that listen to the extreme horror episode that wouldn't have happened without you lucas so again thank you so hey, much for that. All I did was I tagged the right person at the right time. It, I mean, it was literally just timing was great for everybody. How, we got to talk to Lee twice, so I don't think that would have happened because he doesn't have social media. So I don't know how the fuck I would have gotten in touch with him. No, I, that's a shout out to Christine Morgan, hands down. She yes. is she is a gem in the horror community. I mean, she needs to get more praise, period. I agree. She sure does. She's, she's pretty damn funny, too. She's hysterical. Her writing is brutal, unapologetic. I mean, her style is great. Warlock and, you know, all of everything she does is fantastic. She's an amazing human. Fair. Absolutely fair. Uh, final thoughts there, Wiley. All right. I'm going to pimp two things. Uh, one is uh, Dust Bowl Children, which is the book that I co-wrote with my wife. Uh, it is a retelling of Hansel and Gretel in the Dust Bowl, except, you know, Lots more children get eaten than the those two than those two who outwit the witch. So it's uh, it's really good. I I really enjoyed working with her on that, and I just want everyone to go enjoy it just as much as I did. And two is the perfectly fine neighborhood, which is the Kickstarter going on right now for uh, the anthology that Stephen Kosniewski and I are putting together, which is to me an anthology set in the world of our story perfectly fine house and if we get enough money you get short stories from candace nola brian keen jeff strand and me and cause will write one too because you know legacy and all that that's awesome that's great uh, and next- as always th- thank you all for having us on as well i really really enjoyed it sure yeah this was fun and uh for those listening or watching next episode 165 uh is with grady hendrix and guest host cena palio um, you may be asking if you listened to the last episode, that's what you said last time. Well, schedule switcheroo. So jokes on me or you, whatever that rhymes. Um, but for real, now it will be Grady and Cena. Uh, and as always, you have many choices in podcasts. Thank you for listening.